you all. We've missed you guys and very grateful for the time that we had, the things that we've seen and done and learned, but um, it's good to be, be back here. Could do with a little change in the weather where we've been, the highs have been in the upper 50s, uh, low 60s. It's hard to believe that in July, isn't it? But that's the way it is there. So uh, other than that, um, it's just good, good to be back. Um, it, it's, it's great to have family, um, and, and you are our family. Uh, we, we don't have others of our actual blood around us, but, but you all are, are, are that in our hearts, and we're so thankful for each of you and for all your kindnesses to us and your help on, on our trip, and it's just good to be back with you. We thank the Lord. We're going to be looking at um, a portion of Matthew 6 today, continuing on the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll be primarily from verse 1 to 18, but we will uh, not deal with the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer specifically today, but, um, but we'll be uh, from verse 1 through verse 18. Well, let's pray. God, it's, it is just a mercy uh, that, that we are able to be here, that you have, have brought us here, that you have blessed us so greatly in the year that we have been here. We thank you for evidences of, of your work in our own lives and the lives of others, that, that this is orchestrated um, by your providence, that there are no accidents in, in our lives, that, that you order our steps, and we pray that we will be obedient to you and following the, the course that you have laid out for us, that we will be actively pursuing you and, and serving you and, and obedient to your direction as to what we are to do individually as well as corporately. We ask for your wisdom in things that we consider and the, the, the directions that we go, the various things, whether they spiritual be spiritual or temporal that, you, uh, that, that we deal with. We just ask for your wisdom. Uh, for your spirit's guidance. We praise you that we have access to you through the spirit that you have, have given us of yourself in a very real and tangible way and, and that we, we, we may know you, but yet we know that that, that greatly uh, depends upon our pursuit of you, that we are told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that, that we have a responsibility that if you've called us to yourself, now we are to, to be actively uh, engaged. And we just ask for help, Lord, to, to prompt our thoughts, to, to bring us to a recognition of our great need and of your great supply, of your, your, your marvelous goodness to us that is unmerited, that all we deserve is, is death and condemnation, that there is none righteous. No, not one saved for Christ alone, and that it's only in his righteousness that we put our hope. So we ask, God, that you will, you will direct our thoughts to the things that really matter, to the things that are, are paramount, the things that are, 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 are necessary, and those things that honor you, and those things that put you at the forefront, that we will not in any way seek to our, our own glory or, or to bring attention to ourselves, but, Lord, that we could truly experience more of what it means to die to ourselves, to be self-forgetful. Lord, what a freedom that would be. We just ask for your grace because unless you do it, we can't. We won't. Our, our flesh rises up against you. We pray, God, that you will be glorified, that you will be, that you will be elevated, that, that, that you will be magnified in our, in our sight, that, that your word will open up to us, that, that you will speak to us, and that we will have ears to hear. God, that again, you will do a work in our own lives and in this body to the proclamation of the gospel to, to this area, and that, that you would, would bring here um, an evidence of, of a work of God that only you can do. We thank you that there is hope in you, that this is not man's pursuit. But, Lord, we, we pray that it won't be, that we will not do anything here that is be out of our own, our own um, inventiveness or, or creativity or, or, or pragmatic approaches, but that we will seek the face of the living God, that you, Lord, will do a work that can only be explained as something from God. 
We thank you for your word, and as we look into it, we just ask for help in speaking accurately, um, and and that you would anoint the, the word for for our needs, each one, wherever we may be, and that, that you would just meet with us and, and be gracious to us today as we come to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So let's read verses um, 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll skip over to 16 through 18. Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Verse 16, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So this is being spoken to believers. So this isn't to the world. As, as the Sermon on the Mount said, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So he's speaking to people who are, are of the kingdom. They, they are people who, who, are, who, who know God, who have been born again. And, and yet he opens up with this warning. Uh, so even to the believer, uh, there much care has to be given. Also, you know that Jesus here is talking about acts of righteousness. He's not warning them about, you know, sinful things, evil things. He's not saying be careful not to do these things because they are sin. He's talking about the things that we ought to be about. And yet there is still a warning in regard to these good things, these, these acts of righteousness that all of us are expected to participate in. So we must be very wary of all the things that we do, whatever they may be, because as sinful creatures, we have the capacity, even in the good things, to bring sin into it. There is really nothing that we do that does not bring into it some sense of the sinful because, because that's what we are. And, and therefore, it, it should cause us to, to have great concern and great care regarding all the things that we do, but particularly those things that relate to the things of God because they reflect God, they are, they are to God, they are, they are for God, they are, they are for the, the message of God being spoken to the world around us. Therefore, great, great care must be given, given to that. And that's how he opens up with this warning, beware. Now, that's something I think we always ought to take note of, our words of warning. There are lots of them in Scripture. Sometimes they might be given as, as imperatives. You know, you, you must do this, admonitions. Um, strong counsel, exhortations, the, the great encouragement that's being given to us. But sometimes it's, it's, it's a warning, you know, be careful, don't do this, and, and so forth. So, so here is a word of warning, and we need to take um, you know, heed to it. But so obviously, there's, there's danger ahead. There's something that he's saying could be done improperly in, in, a, in a way that does not honor God. And so we need to say, okay, why does he tell us to be aware and then how can we guard ourselves um, against that? The danger has really to do with who is being worshipped. That's really at, at the heart of what he's saying. Who is it that's going to be worshipped in this act, these things that you're doing? Uh, who is it that's going to be the focus? Who's going to receive the glory? And, and so that's his whole point here is, is what is the rationale? What's the motive 
the motivation for what we are doing in regarding, you know, regarding the things um, of, of the spiritual, um, you know, our spiritual lives. The three things that are mentioned here have to do with either, you know, acts of worship, acts of devotion, acts of service. Um, they are the things that reflect God, that reflect what he is like, what he expects us to be as his children. Um, the question then is, who is it that is truly being served by your actions of devotion, of worship, of service, of dedication, um, your spiritual acts? In 1 Corinthians, we know what Paul tells, uh, tells them. He says, whether then you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Doesn't matter whether it's a small thing like eating or drinking. Doesn't matter if it's something like you know, being a missionary and giving your life on a foreign field, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you do, God ultimately is the one to receive glory for that thing. In Colossians, Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Is God the objective? Is what Jesus is, is bringing our minds to, to, to think whom is it that we're worshiping? And the word worship really comes from the word for worthy and, and the acknowledgement of that. And so, so who is worth the worship? Who is worth, um, you know, the, the glory, the, 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 uh, the attention being given to? Is it God that we want the worth and, and who is worthy and we want it to go toward him, the honor, or is it ourselves? You know, Again, we're referring to this word righteousness. We've seen it several times. He says back in, in verse 12 of chapter 5, he says that unless your righteousness is greater than that of the, of the scribes and Pharisees, um, uh, you, know, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And so this, this idea of righteousness is really a significant thing. All of these things Jesus is pointing to in the Sermon on the Mount have to do with, with our likeness to God, living as God. And yet we know that we have no righteousness of our own. Romans 3 tells us that, that there is none righteous, not even one. And so for us to want to take credit for something that we are doing in regard to righteousness would really be competing with God. It would be, it would be robbing God if we are the ones who are putting ourselves at the, at, at the center of that or as the object of that because we don't have any righteousness of our own. God alone has righteousness. When we seek our own glory, we're putting ourselves in the place of God, and we're making really an idol out of ourselves. It is self-worship. Now, one thing that, God, that uh, Jesus indicates here um, is that God sees and knows all. I think it's fitting that our verse for this coming week, uh, verse 168 out of Psalm 119, said, All my ways are known to you. You know everything. And that's really what he is pointing to in verse 6. Um, that, that God knows the rationale. There's a little phrase, a Latin phrase, that I've used it before, that, that is just is good to have in mind. Um, it, the phrase is quorum deo. Quorum, C-O-R-A-M, means before, and deo means God. Everything we do is before God. There is nothing that is hidden from God. Go to Psalm 139. Boy, that is a powerful, powerful chapter it says, I, I can't escape you, God. If I go to the highest heaven, if I go into hell, if I go into the deepest parts of the sea, so you know my, uh, the, the words that are going to come out of my mouth before I even say them. You know everything about me, where I am and what's in my mind. Everything is before God. There's a quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones, a British pastor from the 20th century, that I thought um, spoke well to this. He said, when we wake up in the morning, we should immediately remind ourselves and recollect that we are in the presence of God. It's not a bad thing to say to ourselves before we go any further. Throughout the whole of this day, everything I do and say and attempt and think and imagine is going to be done under the eye of God. He is going to be with me. He sees everything. He knows everything. There is nothing I can do or attempt, but God is fully aware of it all. He says, if that's what we thought each day and reminded ourselves of, it would revolutionize our lives if we always did that. 
The Christian should always really be anxious to know himself. It can be very painful. We tend to resist it. I don't really want to be exposed. Even Socrates, the Greek philosopher, said one of the most important pieces of knowledge you can have is to know thyself. And only really God can show us who we really are, why we really do what we do, what my motivation is. And we should always want to know ourselves because until that is exposed, we can live in self-deceit. We can make ourselves the object of everything. It's, it's really imperative to, to know the problem before we can solve it, to think of it from a medical standpoint. Until it's diagnosed, we don't know what to do with it. We can't treat it. And so we need to be exposed. We need to know who we really are before God because God really knows who we are. Lord Jones goes on to say this. He said, it is only the man who has truly seen himself for what he is who is likely then to fly to Christ and to seek to be filled with the Spirit of God, who alone can burn out of him the vestiges of self and everything that tends to mar his Christian life and living. When I realize how impotent I am, how I really cannot change what I am by nature, I realize the corruption of my nature, that's what will cause me to fly to Christ. And I love that, that, that phrase, fly to Christ, waste no time, get there as fast as you can, get to Christ because only he can bring about the change. But he must expose me, he must, he must bring out all the evil within me, he must show me who I am to know that I have no righteousness, I have nothing to offer him, I can earn nothing. He alone can change. And so we really need to be willing to be brought under the microscope, to be exposed for what we really are, where our heart really stands. And that's what Jesus is talking about. He said, where is your heart? What is the motivation for all of these things, these religious things that you're doing? I mean, think about the people in, in Matthew 7, two groups of people. One group came and said, look at what all we've done for you in your name, Jesus. And they name off all the various things. And Jesus says, depart from me. From me. I don't know you. You were doing a lot of stuff in my name. But it was outside of me. You are outside of me. I don't know you. And then there were those who said, he said, and you went and visited the sick and, and those that imprisoned and, and, and gave to, to the needy. And they said, when, Lord? It's like they didn't even seem to realize they had done it. It's because that was their nature in Christ. They gave themselves for the sake of Christ, not for their own glory. And he said, now enter into my rest because you are my people. It's a good picture of what it looks like to really live to God and not to ourselves. So he gives us three areas here, giving, praying, and fasting. And notice that he says when you do them. This is the expectation that a believer in Christ will do these things. He will give, he will pray, he will fast. Now these are, are representative. They're not necessarily, for one, they're not like the primary things in the Christian life, necessarily like the top three things. But they're more of, of examples of where we find ourselves in, in our relationship to God and our relationship to mankind and how we live before him. And, and, and so these are just representative acts. But, you know, he's saying that, that when you give, you would be expressing, you know, your goodness, your, your generosity, uh, you know, your acts of, of kindness and caring for other people. And, and that's pretty easy sometimes to, um, to want to be... Um, you know, known for, to want to bring glory to ourselves. But he's saying, don't take pride. Don't take pride in acts such as these. Um, and really, again, if I am living that way, if I am practicing these things, these are things that belong to God. This righteousness, these, these acts are things that belong to God. They don't really belong to me. I am God's representative. Who am I as a messenger to take credit for the thing that really God is ultimately responsible for? And so God should be the one to receive glory in the type of acts that would be in, in our, our giving, our, 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 our goodness, our acts of generosity, our, our kindness, um, the things that, um, that would represent the heart of God for people in a hurting world. He says, when you pray, this would be um, more now we're delving into the, the actual the personal spiritual aspect of life. How do I carry out my religion before God? 
Um, he, here he, he uses the word hypocrite as he does later as well. And I think all of us know what a hypocrite is, but, but a good illustration of that is that was actually the term used in the Greek theater because in, in the Greek theater, they would, they would hold masks up in front of their face to represent certain types of characters. And so they, they on, the, on, on the surface, they'd appear to be one thing, but underneath the mask, it's obviously something very different. It, it's, a, it's a front, it's, it's a pretense. And so it's very easy, very easy to do things hypocritically because our heart may not really represent or be what our actions are representing is to put on a show you know, of religious piety, of spirituality, um, things that, that in, our, in our devotion to God, in our, in our exercise of, of our, our spiritual religious life, is it really unto God or is it being done for the sake of other people's opinions? Those things that perhaps I'm expected to do. Well, I should be there, I have to do this. Or, or again, what, what is my ultimate uh, you know, motivation? What is the rationale for why I am doing these things related to my spiritual life? So when Jesus says, go into your inner room, now, there is a place for, for public prayer. And that's something that we see throughout Scripture, corporate prayer, public prayer. It, it's everywhere in Scripture from beginning to end. So he's not saying don't do that. But he's saying it can't be something that is done as a show again. But it would be more like, how do you pray when you're in your inner room? How do you pray when it's just you and God? What, is, what does your heart say? Um, how are you relating? Who, who, are, who are you trying to impress? No one, hopefully, as we're, we're standing before God alone. It's just, just God and, and I. And so in that same way, that same manner, I should come into the public exercise of, of religion. You know, we know the, the, the story of the, the Pharisee and the, the tax collector in the temple the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. And notice it says that. He prayed this to himself. It had no effect um, with God. But his prayer was, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And so here is a man who wants to demonstrate his righteousness, his, his authenticity um, spiritually and religiously, uh, not only you know, glorifying himself, but whomever else might be around to hear that. And acknowledge, oh, what a, what a wonderful, pious, and spiritual man. Look at all that he does. Whereas the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He knew he had no hope. He had nothing to offer. He was a sinner. Which one went down to his house justified that day? It was the tax collector because he was humble before God, looking for God's salvation, God's rescue, nothing of himself, completely empty of any vanity and, and of self-glory. We should seek to pray in public. So again, I, I don't want us to think that that's not something we should be involved in. It certainly is. But it really, we need to evaluate how we pray before God. But it's not only prayer. It's just an example. Again, it's, it's the way that we go about our religious practices, our, our duties, our, our, our privileges um, when we come before God. But what is the rationale for why I'm doing it? Who was the object of this? And, and if there was a sense that this is, is promoting myself, then that's something we need to repent of and need to pray for God's grace that we could turn from that, that he might be truly worshipped as he desires to be worshipped and that he would be the focus and not ourselves. Fasting is another thing. This would be an act of, of an example of our sincerity, our genuineness, our, our, to the depth that we want to go in our devotion to God. I'm taking it beyond just you know, a perfunctory thing, uh, going to church, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to, to even go further that I might, might know God. Again, he says hypocrites. He says the hypocrites they, they, they don't say they're fasting, but it's pretty obvious by what they do that they are. You know, you don't look so good today, brother. What's going on? Oh, you know, yeah, I just, I don't know if I can confess, but I've been fasting. And, you know, and, and, and so, so here they, they, they don't outwardly want to say they are, but they don't, they want everybody to know it. And again, how, how do we go about our acts of, of devotion, of our, our seeking after God, um, are there are these things that, that want to, again, draw attention to ourselves, or are they things that are true and sincere to God 
for the sake of knowing God, for the sake of worshiping God, for the sake of growing in our relationship to God, is he the focus or am I? And ultimately, that's what this verse 1 was talking about. He says, so that you will be noticed by men. But really, the only reason I want to be noticed by men is because I want to receive the glory for it. Now, all of these things have a reward. He talks about it in every one of them. And it all is based on where the value has been placed uh, when we do these things. Do I want to be seen by, by men? Or are these things done from sincere love and devotion to God? With the desire to experience God in them. To know him. To grow in my knowledge of him. In my, my depth of love to him. Is the value placed on man? Well, then I have my reward in full. So whatever attention I get, whatever applause I get then that's it. That's as far as it goes. And probably by next week or next month or next year, it, it, no one will even remember. Do I want that praise? Do I want the applause of men? Do I want men to honor and glorify me? Or would I rather have God be the one who says whether my, my acts are things of worth or not? Praise for man is, is just momentary. But with God, it is eternal. It is written down in his book, and it will never go away. He knows it now. He will know it into all eternity. God's reward is, is put into an account, whereas we'll see later on in, in verse 19, that neither moth nor rust destroy, nor thieves can break in and steal and take these things away from us. So God keeps records of his people, and he rewards his people. Now, I haven't heard a lot of sermons in my life on rewards, and I, I couldn't expound this deeply with you, um, but, but rewards are an important thing uh, mentioned a lot in, in Scripture, and there seems to be a system of rewards um, of, of various values for believers, but before we go to that, I want to be sure we understand this. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is not because of what we did. Salvation is a gift, and Ephesians is very clear about that. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not what he's talking about. It is not a reward. No one deserves salvation. Salvation is solely a work of God, and we did nothing to contribute to our salvation, except I like what Jonathan Edwards said about it. He said, the only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. That's all I could bring is my sin. I have nothing to contribute. It's all by the mercies of God, by the grace of God. It is the free gift of God. Romans 6.23 tells us this, but part A and part B are very distinct. Part A says, for the wages of sin is death. There's the reward. There's a reward for what I am naturally. There's a reward for my sin. It's death. There is a reward regarding salvation, but it's not having it. It's losing. It's being underneath the wrath of God. And the end result, obviously, as it says, is death. That's what I earn. That's what I deserve. That's why we should never make light of sin. Sin is the cause of death. Sin is the cause of everything that's wrong in the world. The one sin of Adam and Eve of disobeying God has brought all that we see wrong with the world, death being the, the final enemy. We can't avoid it. We can't escape it. In Revelation 11, it says that the nations were enraged, having to do with the judgment of God. And your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. That's the judgment. And apart from Christ, we have no hope. Hell is the only option for us. Apart from Christ, the reward is death and hell and misery. Death and condemnation are what every one of us deserve. Every one. It's the just payment for our sin, and it's what we ultimately, we have earned it because we are all sinners, and there's nothing we can do to escape our condemnation or to do enough to earn God's favor. So there is no reward 
as far as salvation is concerned. That's a free gift of God. And it's the humble man, it's the one who is broken, contrite, and recognizes my need and my offense before a holy God. And I have no hope apart from you, O Lord, come and save me by your mercy, by your grace, not by anything that I can do or who I am. And that is our only plea. But then the second part of Romans 6, 23 says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where the hope is as we appeal to Christ. So for believers, there are rewards according to what they have done. Just here in Matthew 5 and 6, the word reward is mentioned nine times that he deals with rewards. Pretty significant. In all of the New Testament, 25 times do we see the word we see the word reward. So this is a significant aspect of, of our relationship to God and what we are doing, what we are, in a sense, earning as, as his children, as, as we, we live unto him, that there is a system of rewards. Now, not all equal, uh, rewards are of equal status. As I said earlier, in 1 Corinthians, we see this. Paul says, now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So it's distinct. It depends on what I've done and, and how I've gone about it and what the motive was. God knows the motives of my heart. He, in my heart, he knows why I'm doing what I'm doing. And each one will be rewarded according to his own labor. Now, if any man builds on the foundation, that of being Christ, if he builds on it with gold, with silver, precious stones, so very valuable things, or with wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day of judgment, the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. Now, we know what fire does is we test things with fire or we strengthen things with fire, pottery and so forth. Fire is, is the proof of, of, of the quality of what's there. It says, so it will be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And if any man's work which he has built on it remains, then he will receive a reward. And if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. It's like, you got in, but you didn't bring anything with you. You haven't done anything, really. And so it's really a, it would be a shameful thing in the sense to think, am I going to bring anything with me when I get to heaven? Will there be any reward for what I've done? Because, again, I could have done all kinds of things in Jesus' name, as Matthew 7 said, and yet I could be told I don't know you. Depart from me. Or, yeah, you got through. You believe. You had faith. You might think I don't know anything about the thief on the cross in heaven, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but he certainly didn't have anything to bring with him. But he's there because he believed in Jesus as, as his Savior. And so there is a distinction, and each man is going to be re rewarded according to his works. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now he's speaking again to believers. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. In other words, while we were alive, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So rewards are significant. They will be there. They are here now. I, again, I, I can't give you a definitive answer of all those things. I don't think anybody can ultimately because we don't know how God will reward. But it is obvious God has a system of rewards. And he is judging that according to the heart, not according to the deed. The deed could be done and receive nothing if the deed comes out of impure motive. So one thing I would say about rewards that I, I think is, in, and I know in the last um, few weeks while we've been gone, um, Sunday nights we were watching a, a video called American Gospel, and it was about the prosperity gospel and how one of the most popular teachings, and it's really um, grown around the world, South America, Africa, places like that, um, the, the idea that, that God just wants to bless you with all kind of good stuff, materially, uh, physically, 
you know, from, from healing to Mercedes and airplanes and, you know, big bank accounts and, and all these kind of things. And if we ever get the idea that's the rewards he's talking about, then we have no idea what he's talking about. It's not about those type of material things. The rewards that God are giving to us, we know, are things that benefit us spiritually. The greatest reward is God himself, just his presence. And as we worship him in spirit and in truth, as he told us that we are to do, God then imparts himself to us, knowledge of him, his peace, his joy, his assurance, his enabling for the trials and the tribulations, as well as for the service. I mean, it's, it's his giving to us those things that we need in order that we might live unto him and, and glorify him. It's, it's only talking about our holiness, becoming more Christ-like, growing in the likeness of Christ. It's his presence. It's his filling of us. It's the enjoyment of him. It's his living in us. It is God himself is our greatest reward. I love what Psalm 73 tells us about that when it says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. Now, now think about that. Everything about me, my health, my, you know, the, the thing I am physically, humanly, it may fail. And it will fail ultimately. But God is the strength of my heart. He is my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You've destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. That was the reward. God himself, the sense of God's presence, walking with us through everything that we go through in life. Oh, what a blessing. That, that's the only hope we have in circumstances of life, is that God himself is walking beside us. We don't know what all the rewards of God may be. Some are things that could be here and now as he, as he provides for us. Some things will be in glory that we won't know until we get there. But we do know that God is keeping accounts. And it's a sad thing to say, again in verse 1, that if you're doing this to be noticed by men, you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. So the bottom line is, whose favor or applause is it that, that I am I'm seeking? Is it man's, which ultimately is saying, is it for myself, for my own gratification, for my own sense of satisfaction, for my own reputation, or is it God's? Do I live by faith in what God says? Or do I, live, do I live by sight, that that I can, can receive, touch, feel, experience? What is it that, that governs the way that I live my life? In seeking the praise of man, I'm, I'm putting myself at the center. I am the objective. I am the object, ultimately, of worship. And therefore, I'm actually robbing God of what is rightfully due to him. So I would ask myself then, in regard to these things, as I think about areas of my life, um, the, these things of the Christian life that should be there, these things should be present. But, but do I desire, am I willing to be convicted and corrected by God that I might live unto him and not to myself? When, when, when I am shown this, when, when God reveals my own heart to me, do I want that? Do I resist it? Do I not want to be told? Do I not want to see myself as I really am? Do I have the ears to hear what the Spirit tells me? as he examines me through the scriptures, through preaching, through whatever means that his word comes into my life? Do I want to say with Paul that it's no longer I who live but Christ or that I've been crucified with Christ? Is that my desire? Or do I still want to elevate myself? What is the motive? So I go back to finish just looking at verse 1 again because I think this is really the, it encapsulates, encapsulates everything that is being said here. It's the warning. It's the, the beware. Take note. Be careful. Examine yourself. Know where you stand. God knows. God knows what we do, and he knows why we do it. He weighs the motives of our heart. There is nothing hidden from God's sight. We can fool man. We can even fool ourselves, but we can never fool God. Do I want God's revelation to come into my life that I might be set free of myself? 
in order that I might know him and live unto him and therefore receive from him all that he desires to give to his children. You know, we know that, that God knows our hearts. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew 15, and he was quoting Isaiah when he said this. He said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. He knew the heart. He knew what was at the bottom of all that they were doing. We can't fool God. We're either going to serve ourselves or we're going to serve God. And it's what is in the heart is from where that flows. In both cases, we said there is a reward. It might be now. Oh, you're a great man. Oh, you've done this. Oh, that's great. We'll put a monument up to you. I mean, whatever those kind of things are. And if that's all it is, it ends with the dying. There is nothing left. It's like a vapor. It just appears for a little bit, and then it's gone. It's weightless. It has no substance. So do I want God's applause or praise? And again, not for the sake of, of like making myself something, but, but as I said again in, in, in Matthew 7, those people didn't even seem to be aware when, when God, Jesus said, you know, you've done this and that, and then they said, when, Lord? When do we do that? Didn't even notice it. It's because that was the outflow of their life from a heart that was fully given to God, that God would be glorified. And as we've said before, the, the first question of the Westminster Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and, therefore, in light of that, to enjoy him forever, to enjoy God, to receive from God those things that he wants to give. You notice that in in, in these verses, it talks about God who is in secret and sees in secret. Um, it, it's something I would like to explore actually further to, to think on, on that, that, that God who is in secret and yet he's everywhere. He hears everything. He knows everything. But he is in secret. He sees in secret. He knows these things. Nothing can be hidden. Therefore, from a positive side of that, there is nothing that can be hidden from him in regard to my need, my heart, the things that are going on inside of me that maybe I can't even express to others. God knows and sees all, whether it be those things that dishonor him or those the, the, the cry of our heart. That's why, you know, in Romans it talks about not being able to pray or knowing what to pray, but the spirit intercedes with groanings that are too deep for words. So the beauty of God, the secrecy, the, the innermost place that God lives within us. And David expressed the idea of this, this truth in his innermost being in Psalm 51, having committed the, the adultery and the murder. And then he has now been um, reconciled with God. He said, behold, you, God, desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. So create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That, I hope, would be our prayer, that there would be truth in the innermost being, that I won't deny, I won't, I, won't, I won't refuse God access, because only God can heal, only God can expose the, the disease, and only God can heal the disease. And that's what David was saying, oh Lord, create in me a clean heart, give me truth in my innermost being, that I may truly Know you, seek you, love you, live unto you. So how are we then to be aware? How can we be aware? I think David was expressing that partly when really what he's saying is, I want to love you, God. Do I love you? Think about what Jesus said to, to Peter after the resurrection. And Peter was so anxious, he dived off the boat and swam to shore to see Jesus Three times, Jesus said, do you love me? Well, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my lambs. Do you love me? That seemed to be the point. If you love me, these things will be true of you. These things will be true because I will do it out of heart of love. Why do we do what we do for the people that we love? It's because we love them. Do we expect a reward necessarily? No, we do things for those that we love because we love them, because we want good for them, because we, we want the best for them. If our, we are seeking to grow in our love to Christ, it will change the rationale, the motive for everything I do because I want to honor him. I want to please him. I want to experience him in this. It's not a perfunctory duty I'm doing. It's No, it's unto the Lord. 
So we should seek to grow in our love to God, in our love to Jesus, to know the fullness of the Godhead. Who is the Father? What has the Father done? Who is the Son? What has the Son done? Who is the Spirit of God that we might know God more fully, therefore appreciate him more, reverence him more, honor him more, seek to, to therefore glorify him more in all that we do. It's an active pursuit of God. That's how we're going to be aware. Be, that's how we will beware. That's how we can know why we're doing what we're doing. It's the active pursuit of God and love to God and considering all of God's attributes and who he is and, and thinking on these things and, and seeking to live in close communion with God. If we neglect time with God, it's to our detriment because the flesh is never still. The flesh is always attacking. The flesh is always ready to take opportunity in our life. The world is ready to take opportunity. Satan is ready to take opportunity. He's like a, a roaring lion prowling about, seeking someone to devour. If we neglect time, communion with God, we are at great risk. We're at great danger. And even, therefore, the things that we do religiously can just be obligatory, you know, perfunctory religious duties that have no value. We ought to recall his particular mercies to, to us. How has God been merciful to me? How has he shown his grace to me that I would live, therefore, in gratitude? Sometimes we can get so negative when we see all the things that we wish weren't and not see the things that are. And who God is and what he has provided and how he, what his promises are to us. But to focus on the goodness and the mercy and the, and the privilege it is to know God. To live in gratitude. You know, that's one of the things in Romans 1 where it talks about the depravity of man. And one of the things it says, and they did not give thanks. Even knowing that God was there, they did not give thanks. They had a hard and puffed up proud heart that lived unto themselves to give thanks to God, I should seek to have a realistic view again of myself so that I could say with John the Baptist, Lord, you must increase, I must decrease. Help me to be self-forgetful that you become more and more in me. And pray that God will just give us the grace to desire these things, to pursue these things, to not be negligent, to not be lazy, but to pursue him with all that we have. When we desire glory, we're competing with God. We're saying, I am more important than you. We must want to elevate Christ and to, to bow before him in reverence. Well, I think about, lastly, just uh, an image of this that we see from, from um, Hebrews talking about Moses. You know, Moses lived... In three 40-year segments, the first 40 years he was in Egypt, the, basically the Pharaoh's son, all the privileges of, of royalty and all that he had, the benefits that he had. He killed a man for um, attacking someone else. It was a defense, but he killed a man and he fled. 40 years he spent in a desert somewhere. We don't really know anything except he was a shepherd, and, and he lived in obscurity for 40 years shepherding sheep. One day, God met him in a burning bush, called him into something completely different. Here he is, 80 years old, and he kind of tried to excuse himself, saying, well, I, I, I stutter. I'm not, I'm just not the man God had chosen Moses. And it was not an enjoyable duty for the next 40 years with all the complaining and whining logistics that, that it took to get everybody out of, out of uh, Egypt and through the wilderness. And of course, he himself ended up dying uh, not getting going to the promised land because he refused to, to honor the Lord or make his name holy uh, before the people. But in Hebrews 11, it says this about him. It says, Moses, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. The reproach of Christ was worth more to him than all the treasures of Egypt. What if he had stayed in Egypt? Who would he have been? Would we have known who Moses is? What would Moses' legacy have been? Nothing. Yet he would have had all the benefits that life in anywhere in the world could have given to a man at that time. But he considered the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. 
He was looking to the reward. He knew there was something greater. He knew that, that, that there was something worth giving his life for. Even eventually, it meant it just had to be one huge headache all the time for Moses. We know what the people of Israel were like. And yet, the reward. Think of what Moses has today. Think of where he stands. May that be the vision we have, that nothing in this world could compete with our desire to see Christ, knowing that the reward will be worth anything that we give up in this world. Let's pray. Father, we do ask for help. We're just so weak and so naturally human and fleshly. But God, you've been so merciful to point these things out, to show us the truth about ourselves. Help us, Lord, not to deny it, not to resist it, but to fully open ourselves up that you might have access, that you might do the work, that you might expose us. That, Lord, whatever the motives that we have, the rationale, the, the whys and the whats, Lord, that they could be considered according to what your word tells us. And that, Lord, we would live unto you because in that way only will you be glorified. And that way only, I think, will you act on behalf of your people. If we seek things for our own blessing or merit or applause or praise, we'll get it perhaps. But to what end ultimately would help us to live with, with yielded hearts, with, with broken hearts before you, humble hearts before you, that, Lord, you would be preeminent in our lives personally, that we would pursue you with, with, all, uh, with all of our effort, all of our heart, and that then together, Lord, you would bind us together to serve you in a way that, again, can only be explained by this as a work of God. We praise you for the hope that we have in that, that you've made it possible. Lord, give us grace. As we look to you, in your name, Jesus, we ask. Amen.